I know you're going to dig this. This is Ryan McLenn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles, recorded live here at DATV Studios in Dayton, Ohio. Zooming from the funk capital of the world, Dayton, Ohio, is Samuel Carter, slash keyboardist for the funk group Steve Arrington's Hall of Fame and the funk group Slave. Welcome and thank you for agreeing to be on the show with us today. How are you? I'm fine, Ryan. Thank you for having me today. Oh, it's exciting to have you. And it is always exciting to have folks that are right here in Dayton, Ohio, that played such a key role in the funk era. You know, one of the things about you growing up that with your parents, and I, I, I knew your mother, Lula, and uh, your dad, William, that you had an adventure in uh, the music world that, that triggered you to where you are today. And I think what makes it really interesting for us, Sam, is that you, you, you understood it, you enjoyed it, just kind of like you had a fling with it, but, uh, and, and then you recognized that you, you had to make a choice. So we'll talk about that. You went to John H. Patterson High School, which is uh, no longer there. Exactly. <laughs> okay. And what college did you attend uh, for a year? Uh, Wright State. Wright State. And then you got that bud. You know, I remember Clarence Young. Um, yeah. Oh, yes, because, you know, he was always making music writing yeah. songs uh, i remember he i always remember the song he wrote for mayor mcgee and uh <laughs> and, and, and uh and he played it at a fundraiser for mayor mcgee out at lakeview palladium i'll never remember that he had was he was banging on that piano and singing that song and and so uh, but i didn't from reading from your bio i didn't realize that um I know, I know he had the Theater West, and he really worked hard at being in the theater business. Now, what mm -hmm. role did you play when you were with the theater? Were you an actor or were you a musician? Uh, both. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I was a musician, actor, uh, producer. Uh, at one point, we had a radio show that came on uh, WHUR at Howard University came on at 10 p.m. on Saturday nights called Your Theater of the Air. Uh, I produced it, uh, Clarence wrote it, and we acted in it with some other players. Uh, it was a very interesting, exciting time. Uh, of course, a lot was going on in D.C. That's where I met a lot of my uh, first friends in my musical community. Uh, spent a lot of time there, uh, Gil Scott Heron, uh, Brian Jackson, who played with Gil, was a good, good friend to this day. And uh, uh, Brian and I used to play a lot of clubs when we weren't playing with our respective bands. It was Brian Jackson, myself, and uh, a guy by the name of Alan Barnes, who was with uh, the funk group Blackbirds. And we would play jazz clubs around uh, Washington, D.C. Also included Delbert Taylor. Uh, Delbert's passed uh, away now. Alan Barnes passed away a couple years ago. But uh, we did a lot of work in D.C., a lot of playing, a lot of music, a lot of jazz, a lot of experimental things. Uh, so it was fun. 
You know, what's really interesting is that I, until I read your uh, information, I didn't realize that, uh, that Clarence's uh, theater, West, uh, made uh, its home in D.C. Um, yeah. Because I've always thought he was here in Dayton. And, um, and that you all did all that East Coast. And, and, yeah. and, and of course, at that time, it was really... Um, well, that was that was that was exciting times in so many ways. So yeah, yeah, it was a lot going on, and uh, in the music world and in D.C., a lot of theater was going on. Uh, who was Robert Hooks was there a lot, so we hung out. Uh, uh, Kevin was little, uh, and I had a lot of friends that were here in Dayton that ended up in D.C. It was pretty electric. Uh, uh, one of my favorite professors, uh, uh, Dr. Yvonne Chappelle, uh, oh. f from Wright State. Yes. Yeah, she yes. ended up moving to uh, D.C. when she was and she was pregnant with uh, Dave. And I remember them, and I remember Dave when he was a little fella. Uh, so D.C. was like jumping for like a lot of energy. So how long did you spend in D.C.? Would you say? Uh, at least five years. I think it was five years in D.C. before I came back. Yeah, so I see when you came back, when you left Theater West, you returned to Dayton, and then you played with Sammy Stevens. Sammy Stevens and the Ephesians. And uh, I remember them very well. Yeah, so we did that uh, for a while. I played drums with him. So how did you get the, the, the job as a director at the WD? WDTN. Yeah. Uh, actually, it was uh, it was Sammy. Sammy Stevens told them to hire me uh, because I was passing through. I had come to Dayton. I wasn't planning on staying. And uh, Sammy heard about me playing the drums. And he came and he heard me. And then he took me to a, a studio in Cincinnati. And he took all of his old drummer tracks off and told me to play the drums. And I did that. And then he said, I need you to stay around town. I said, man, I'm, I don't have anything to do here in Dayton. He says, I can fix that. So he told them at uh, Channel 2, because he was doing a syndicated show out of uh, 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 WDTN called the Gospel Showcase. And in order to keep doing that syndicated show there, they had to hire me because that's what he said. <laughs> so they hired me, and I started learning, uh, doing directing and that type of thing. Wow, that was, a, you know, that was, um, for a young, young man, that was a, a, a huge step uh, and of learning some skills there. And uh, to know that Sammy had that kind of pull. Um, at yeah, the, Sammy had pull. At the Channel <laughs> 2. So, and then, okay, so while you're doing this, and and you you learn how to be a director and you're playing with Sammy and the Ephesians and you get the call of the win again and you leave for New York. So what made you leave for New York at that time? Uh, honestly, it was just uh, itchy. I, I didn't like what was going on in, uh, in uh, the regular workforce at that time in television. Uh, it was still limited opportunities, even though. <laughs> and uh, they had, I had a few things happen that kind of just turned me off. So I decided to just put my stuff in my car and drive to New York. And that's what I did. So what was, what was WNYE? That was a television station in New York. It was a public television station. So I worked there for a little while. Uh, before I started working uh, as an administrator for the city of New York, because you you know you got to work in New York. I worked a lot in uh, D.C. Uh, just musically. All I did in D.C. was theater and music, uh, and I was able to survive uh, because the cost of living was much different. But when you're in New York, uh, you, you got to get up and get it. <laughs> so. <laughs> If you weren't doing studio sessions every day and making money at that level, which I, I wasn't uh, at that time, 
uh, you had to have another job. So I worked in the television station and from the skills I had learned from here in Dayton and then uh, got a better paying job doing an administrator work for the city of New York. So I did that for a while. So how long were you in New York? Uh, about another total, eh, close to five years. I was at, at that time, uh, about two years into New York, uh, I ended up with uh, Slade. Uh, I didn't really know them in Dayton, to be you know, uh So how did you meet Slade in New York? Well, my brother, uh, Charles Sedell Carter, who's a, uh, he was a Berkeley graduate. So he went to Berkeley School of Music in Boston. Ooh. And uh, he knew horn arrangements. He, you know, he could do all the stuff. So he was doing a horn arrangements for Slave on uh, uh, their upcoming album they were working on. And I, I went by the studio uh, just to hang out. Um, and they, uh, the piano, the keyboard player had left uh, by that time. And they asked me to sit in and just help because I could play, and by the time I sit in, I really learned a lot of my music from uh, uh, pretty solid jazz guys. So it wasn't too hard to sit in and, and do what was needed. Uh, and so they said, hey, great, nice chords, nice progressions. Can you hang out with us for a while? And I said, nah, I, I'm a drummer, man. I, I'm not, I'm not going to. And they said, well, look, if, you know, if you play the piano, we got, we'll pay you a retainer, X amount of dollars a week. We'll pay you for rehearsal. Uh, we'll pay for studio time. You'll get uh, your residual income from writing. And all of a sudden, I realized I was a keyboard player. <laughs> <laughs> OK. OK. <laughs> Beat starving. Yeah, it does. So then you ended up with Slave, which evolved into a group called Steve Steering Town Hall, Hall of Fame, along with yeah. your brother. Yeah. And so, yeah. and you became one of the primary uh, composers for that band. Yes. Uh, that was another adventure. And uh, <laughs> so we did that. And. Uh, uh, went on to write a couple albums, uh, do some touring. What were the albums? Uh, I don't know. You had to ask Dave. He know he knows more about that stuff than I do. You know, a lot of even talking now, I'm trying to bring up stuff. Uh, had to do a quick bio. I, you know, I've moved. That's so far back. I don't remember the name of the albums. Okay. That's bad, isn't it? No, I mean, I guess it's just not a priority for you. Uh, That's the point, right, it's not. And, and so, um, and, and I respect that. But is your name on the albums? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, well, I'll dig them out and find you. Uh, yeah, yeah the, the names are on there, the pictures are on there. Uh, it was one of the few pictures. I, I tried to avoid pictures most of the time. I learned that in the jazz world to kind of stay low key. It was it, easier. Well, it sounds to me like the jazz world had a lot of influence on you. And uh, in, in, oh, in, yeah. in, in oh, many yeah. areas, as even with your uh, relationships with the musicians as. Yeah, it was a different, uh, 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 they had a different approach to community in the jazz world. So, I mean, I can tell you, I know I've done, you can hang out. I've played with George Benson, uh, 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 had opportunities at home. I, uh, uh, Milt Jackson, a lot of people don't know who Bags is, Milt Jackson. And just a lot of, and they hang, they play, you know. Uh, uh, you could go, if you could go cut it, you could play. I remember the first, uh, when I did, uh, did do this date uh, with, uh, George Benson, it was on a last minute thing. Uh, and it's guys when it was at uh, George Washington University. And you know, in that day, again, different from kind of the funk community, they would tell you, here are the tunes we're gonna do. And most tunes that were jazz classics or whatever, you knew what they were. 
And if he was going to jam or do something, say, hey, I'm getting ready to do this. Uh, it's going to be an F. Drummer, I need you to do this. I need you to do that. And they talk you through it. He counted off, and then you play. But that was the level of proficiency you had to be to eat back in that day. And it's all the way to the point now where uh, people are just sampling, using Apple uh, loops. And that's cool uh, for whatever that creativity is, but it's a different uh, uh, space in the brain and the thinking uh, that people don't have access to. It's a different space when you become proficient enough to be, uh, to be able to imp do improv on music. And improvisational music uh, hitting a different space, it's not, it's not as wild and unconnected as people may think. It comes from a lot of discipline of just really knowing your way around a particular instrument and uh, sitting at it alone, a long time. So that's one of the things I like about uh, jazz. It's like learning. Uh, it's like learning a language. When you got to play with all these cats, they just made you play. And I used to have guys come up behind me and say, "You just need to play, young hot rod. Do this, do that." And, they, and you just play. And when you learn music that way, you have a different approach. Uh, music. Uh, uh, when it's really stiff, you learn a lot of the fundamentals like this, and you only, it's like, if you had to know grammar before you could learn to talk, you'd have a problem. If you had to know how to read words before you could talk, you'd have a problem. But once you learn to read words and you learn how to talk, and you, then you learn the, the syntax of words, and you learn how to put words in a sentence, and you learn how to use words in a sentence appropriate to the context in which you're communicating so that everybody else can hear you, and then you get the feedback from everybody else. That's the same thing with music, especially with jazz. You learn, and to a, to a good degree on some really sharp funk guys, you learn the language first. You learn the language and get the syntax down, then you get the communication, you get the magic. But uh, I, I got the root of that from hanging out in jazz. It was, it was just the way it was. So when you got into the funk uh, band with, uh, and with the slave, no, yeah, with slave, uh -huh. and, and uh, beginning to progress there, you went, when you went on to, to be with the Steve Arrington's Hall of Fame, how was that transition for you in playing your, your drums, right? No, I was playing keyboards for That's the That's right, you played keyboards because... Yeah, I play, I was, I was, yeah, I play a lot more drums now, but at that time I was playing uh, uh, keyboards. And uh, it was different. It was very different. But uh, one of the things you'll learn or that you see in the music industry is uh, change. And uh, understanding change is uh, very important because if you don't understand it, you'll get frustrated by it. Well, uh, well, one of the things that I found out now is that one of your albums was American Funk. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Showtime album. And uh, it's Showtime album. I remember Showtime. I helped do the uh, cover design for Showtime. I forgot about that. Yeah, so I just wanted to let you know that we were on top of you being able to get this information on those two, <laughs> two albums, okay? Well. <laughs> we, we, we just here to help, help you tell your story. Now, and now moving on, and so while you were with um, the Steve Arrington's Hall of Fame, how long were you with the, originally with the band? That's a good one. Uh, maybe a couple of years or so. A couple of albums, whatever that's worth. Okay. You, <laughs> so you're I, not, not going to even know, call them years. You're just going to call them a uh, product. A couple of albums. Because okay. you, you talk about chronology and music. You, you kind of go by the milestones. You know, I did a couple albums here. Or I played a, a few dates here. I mean, 
the years kind of all you know run together for me. So how did that. you did you travel with did you travel with them at all and and and, and play? Yeah. Well, yeah, where, we all, where where all did you go? I have to. You and the albums, where at, and I'm just being funny. Where did you all go? Where did you go? <laughs> America. We went around America. So uh, there were a lot of uh, places we played. Uh, we played most of the major coliseums. That's how the, that's what we did. Also, you, also you got a chance to play with the, on Don Kirshner's rock concert. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot about that. You played at the Don Kirshner's uh, rock concert. We did, yeah, we did Don Kirshner's rock concert. We did uh, Soul Train. All right. Now give me some yeah, highlights. I forgot I about mean, that. <laughs> <laughs> give Give me some highlights of of your touring and playing with uh, the band. Ah, uh, you I, you know what. Uh, being and we're here and we're being transparent and just telling it like it is please do all right i was bored stiff because uh the you talk about highlights we played all the coliseums look alike all the hotels look the same all the buses were about the same uh you know the, the, the airports and when you got somewhere to play they wanted to hear the music the same way it was on the album uh, you didn't get to do any extended creative playing like you did. I come out in that jazz background, and part of feeding my soul and my musical energy was the ability to uh, actually uh, extrapolate and, and, and build on a creative idea and explore where it goes. That's over with when you're playing tours like that and album. They want it like the album, so you go in, you do it, and you get finished. And honestly, uh, you start to feel like a, a, a group of trained monkeys that they put into something and cart you somewhere, put you on a stage and tell you to go at it, take you off and do it somewhere else. That's the way it got to be for me. So I transitioned out of the business after a while and it wasn't that hard because uh, I, had, I had little kids at that time and, they kind of liked to see me when I came home. And, uh, you had people screaming for you on the road, but it was nothing like your kids running up to hang on you and say, Daddy, Daddy. You know, and, and your wife, they, they know you're a jerk, <laughs> but they still care for you. But the people on the road are just people on the road. Nothing negative to them. I appreciate all the fans, all the support they've had over the years for anything that I've done creatively. But uh, in terms of trying living that as a lifestyle, it was not for my makeup. Some people can do that. It was not for my makeup. Well, one of the things that uh, it that it appeared that during some you did two two albums with us with the uh, the band, and then it became you talked about there was some chaos that became um, kind of like over. Right overbearing with you that made you forced you to to make a decision on whether you wanted to stay in this genre or move on exactly um, you can can you talk about that a little bit uh, that's nothing really to talk about with that it's just old uh things of uh people choosing to go in different directions on, on how they want to do things and uh uh and when it got to that point, it was actually a good stopping point for me uh, because uh, when things happened that kind of took it off the rails, it happened so suddenly. And it happened at a point where you either uh, went on somewhere else to rebuild or you just stayed within that uh, vacuum into that thing that I've seen people do even to this day where they've never really done anything big, but they've kind of been able to survive and, then, and you don't really see anything creative happening with them. And God bless them, that's their choice, that's what they do. Uh, how did you but get, I chose a different direction. How did you get paid when you were uh, with the band? How did they what, pay what you? you? Did they pay you on, 
after a show, or did they pay you by the week? Uh, did they yeah, pay you got you know you got paid by the week, that kind of thing, and you got your royalties and different things. But I, I mean, I worked, uh, did some things for other people. Uh, I remember doing a, a working session with a guy by the name of Arif Martin, uh, who was a producer for uh, Warner Brothers Atlantic Records. He is a producer there. Uh, I did some things for him when he was working on a Melissa Manchester uh, album. Didn't have the good sense to really push into that relationship. <laughs> I was a young idiot, so eh, it goes with being ignorant. So I didn't push into that relationship. Uh, he goes on and produces a lot of Shaka, uh, Shaka Khan and all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, so got out of it, went back to school, and I and and, and I haven't. It's I, I've had some exciting uh, uh, things that I've been able to do since I've gotten out of that aspect of of life, uh, and and a lot of my music experience and uh, being a funk musician. Uh, it's been interesting and been a part of it, but I've gone on to do school, uh, work in higher education. I even work in higher e education now. Uh, I work for Xavier University uh, in Cincinnati. Um, uh, I've been a vice president of a university, uh, CIO of a university, uh, which is a lot different than playing music, but. If you're going to get out, it, it's very, it was, it, you know, it's adventurous to me. I, I, I kind of enjoyed the years, the early years of students. I never, uh, I wasn't a, a professor or anything, but I, I've had a lot of interactions with students because I ended up kind of getting along with them, hanging out. I did have one student that recognized me. Uh, it came up to the office and said, I, I know who you are. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> And then I said, oh, where would you find that? On your mother's uh, record album? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you ever miss doing some jamming? Uh, yeah, I like jamming. I, I do miss that. I definitely do miss that. I really do. Because it's like hanging out, having a conversation. And, and it's like getting together with your buddies and talking. And... and, and that's how music is. Uh, and you have a good, when you have an interactive conversation where people are sharing ideas back and forth, it, it, it's really cool. And you got a chance to come over to my house and jam in my oh. studio. Remember, uh, remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've definitely done some jamming with, uh, with Webb. Uh, and, uh, and that's fun. Right now, I, I spend a lot of time, I, I actually jam at home by myself. Well, you so. can come over. I can come over and sit in if you need me to come and sit in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I sit. I sit here at the house. I have a, a, a rolling V session, uh, professional set set up. Uh, I have keyboards, uh, and uh, I jam with those, and then I kind of get back to work at times. Why do you think it's important for us to have the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center here in Dayton? Well, it's, uh, it's another aspect of Dayton. Uh, uh, Dayton had a unique part in a lot of music. This area did. Uh, not only did a lot of funk music come out of here, but a lot of people don't know that uh, Billy Strayhorn yeah. was born in Dayton. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a lot of people don't know that. They don't even know who Billy Strayhorn <laughs> is. Well, you know who he is, Ryan, and I know who he is. <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he was Duke Ellington's piano player and arranger and shared in writing Take the A Train, uh, uh, Satin Doll, all those things. He's from Dayton, Ohio. Uh, so you have a lot of people from Dayton, uh, uh, and so it just builds on that legacy. Uh, and it's fine. Like I say, my mom is from Dayton, and my mom is one of uh, the black female inventors of her day. Uh, she, I don't have a star at Walk of Fame down in Dayton, but my mother got a star on the Walk of Fame in Dayton. <laughs> So there, there's a lot going on in Dayton. 
They're, they're sure, she sure does. Um, I, I just want to thank you for taking this time to share your story with us on Funk Chronicles. We wish you the best in everything that you do. And this has been a very enlightening uh, to, to talk to you today. So I wish you the best, Samuel Sam it. Carter. And this, okay. is, this is Ryan McLinn, host of the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Tell Center's award-winning show. Funk Chronicles. Until the next time, <laughs> keep it funky, funky, funky. <laughs> keep it funky. As we say in the industry, close it. Oh, mm -hmm.